Hello, Ivy here. This week's podcast is entitled I Can't Believe What You Say Because I See What You Do. Podcast number 61. Here's an introduction. This podcast looks at the less than confident belief that the UK monarchy and its partners have certain sectors of the population in their thoughts with their apparent views on those sectors. Partners in this case are, as I have stated many times in previous podcasts, are as follows. Government, aristocracy, police, media, both printed and televised. As the title suggests, those perceptions are based on what each of those societal groups do. And by the way, it also includes the monarchy, which I forgot to mention of all the groups. It is based on what, I said, each of those societal groups do, not what they say when elections are near, or any of their fellow groups mentioned are in the limelight for not so glowing reasons. As usual, each have the other's backs because each of them on their own are less powerful than when they, when they come together. The extreme views held by many in these groups, and that is not an assumption, there is hard evidence readily available. The protection of each other preserves and maintains the power of the group. In terms of royal activities and the obvious push to preserve certain spaces for certain types of approved groups, I think you should always keep in mind that when people are pushed into a corner, there comes a point when they have nowhere else to go, but force their way out of it despite the arrows continuously coming over the hill towards them. The UK people have limited room in that metaphorical corner. So, be aware. As followers of the SG UK podcast community are aware, I do not make podcasts based on the day-to-day trivia. As important as that is, having it repeated several times a day and week, and month, in a variety of media choices, only serves to try and bombard the UK people with information such that it brings out negative opinions about the subject matter. I, however, take a stand back and I look for patterns both in terms of the content of the so-called news being reported and by whom. The old adage, follow the money, is very apt in most cases and definitely leads one down different avenues and trains of thought than that published in the literary liners masquerading as newspapers. The fact that the televised news media regurgitates this so-called information almost word for word and certainly use same or similar phrases as the newspaper industry indicates to anyone with logic that this is not accidental and is very much a coordinated effort to achieve an unspecified result that increasing numbers are beginning to recognise. In a recent evaluation of all the podcasts done in the first year of SGUK, themes emerged and a report produced giving percentages. For this podcast, there is no need for me to go into percentages. The group topics and themes are the most important aspect here. This podcast is centred around those themes. It lists the podcasts that covered those themes. The podcast will cite examples of what part of the establishment played in the content of those themes and the conclusions that emerged for each podcast and the theme concerned. This podcast will give examples how members of the establishment reacted, and in particular the British royal family, not least because this is increasingly impacting on the global stage and their opinions of the changing face of the UK, or to some of us, the real face of the UK, in small but vocal groups within, with members in powerful places, is now emerging. I suggest that the establishment's behaviour on a number of factors has led to a wider number of people in the UK 
to feel confident to do and say certain things, as their government ministers clearly use similar phrases when speaking about certain members of the population. We even have government reports published and made available for everyone to see where the government stands now and its general direction of travel. The isolationist approach is abundantly clear. If a nation decided it can do everything on its own, a basic amount of research would inform whether or not such an approach would have a negative impact on the UK economy and reputation in the world. Considering the speed at which the UK is falling down most measurable factors, that interests the UK population and its global partners or former partners, it is safe to say that the UK post-Brexit 2016 is dipping its toes in the toxic slurry that has emerged. And it won't be long before we are drowning in it. The condition of those who survive that dunking by their establishment figures will be weary and looking for answers and remedies. Alongside these themes that emerged and the title of the podcast that come under each of these themes, I have given examples of how those establishment groups have reacted or commented on the topics raised in the theme via their media pals, and in particular the reaction of the British royal family through its association in the UK tabloid media world. The third element in this discussion is the inclusion of a series of quotes by a very eminent individual, quotes based over many decades of interviews, televised and printed, together with an array of highly respected successful books. The highly respected academic and author in question is James Baldwin. When you see these quotes and the year in which they were made, we should all ask ourselves how much, if anything, has changed. Like all SGUK podcasts and the accompanying article, will have a conclusion of its own. At the heart of our podcast, as a reaction and activities sanctioned and or delivered by the UK against the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Princess Meghan in particular. I will use that name from now on because it seems that since Tyler Perry used it on social media, the UK royalists, I say royalists but they are not, they are Princess Meghan haters, the UK royal support base has once again shamed itself on the global stage. Meghan is the princess via her marriage to Prince Harry and because so many of you are making your empty head spin over that fact, it is something that you should all sit down, touch some grass and re-evaluate your priorities in life. What has been happening to Princess Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, and also Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, all because he married a woman of colour, has revealed the dark underbelly of the UK. The result of this is that every person of colour anywhere, not just the UK, is affected in a variety of ways by these actions and this behaviour, which started in 2016. Every poison arrow sent to harm this couple, particularly Princess Meghan, is an arrow that lands in the heart of people of colour everywhere, and all other hues of the population where they have common sense and ethics and values. So think on, every deed against the Sussexes is a deed against the global sectors of the population, as mentioned. Just like I stated at the beginning of this podcast, when those societal groups operate alone, they are less powerful. But when they all come together, they are more powerful. Well, think of a global magnitude of people who feel disenfranchised, and considered less than, and hurt by those acts of wickedness perpetrated against the Sussexes. Imagine how we all feel. Imagine all those suffering at the hands of the powerful, but who do not have a voice. 
Imagine all those human rights are being violated on a regular basis and who can see no way out. Imagine how it looks to see a member of the royal family in the UK behave in this way towards a person of colour who entered the family by marriage and who was abused on UK soil for three years and continues to be abused by UK representatives on USA soil now. All those voices of the unheard need to be heard and the situation of the Sussexes and deliberate attempts to create a second Princess Diana occurrence is palpable. Now there is a global support network formed to speak up about the abuses of the Sussex family and in doing so bring awareness about the modern ways in which abuse is conducted across borders on occasions and is being ignored because the abusers are often powerful and wealthy. To use a similar analogy regarding small groups coming together to support a cause, the Global Support Network, and I know you know who I am referring to, UK media have tried various names over the last six years, but they now at least realise it is a network of telephone number proportions with a skill set and life experiences that are not like any other support network in existence. Each of us are like drops of water in various locations, but combined, we form an ocean. Let's have a look at the themes that have emerged. First theme, when I say first, I mean just in the order that is um, here and my notes, it is not in order of percentage wise of the overall scores. You'll see that in the article. So coordinated hate and the podcasts in the first 12 months that came under this banner. Herd mentality. Are we being programmed? UK, British royal family, government propaganda failing. Who will be the next whipping boy or girl? The psychology of resentment. You do not know what you have until it's gone. Collective narcissism. That ship sailed, bro. Welcome to the Royal Hunger Games. In the article, there are a number of James Baldwin quotes listed at the end of each of the themes. And right at the end of the article, there's a list of 100 quotes by James Baldwin. I am not going to read through those 100 and I'm not going to read through the ones I've got listed under each of the themes. You will see that in the article. And part of the reason for that is to try and keep the podcast shorter than it has been on the last couple of occasions and also feedback from one listener last week that suggested that hour and 20 minutes was too long so with that in mind i am going to make the podcast much shorter over the next three to four weeks i would welcome feedback from all of you about that and if i was to go um beyond say half an hour I would still think 45 minutes to an hour is sufficient that's what I would aim for I think because some of the, the the content that we discuss would be extremely rushed over half an hour or so but just so that you know the time this wine is going to be shorter but you will have a lot of reading to do or to access if you wish in the article and there are also around, I think, something like seven or eight um, video links of James Baldwin talking about um, various topics, but all of which come under our themes. And clearly, I'm not going to play those in the um, podcast video because that will also take up time. They're all around, I would say, five minutes in length, some of them a little bit longer. Um, but it's good to actually see the gentleman himself um, being interviewed and giving his views on a number of things. So, just to give a couple of quotes under this section from James Baldwin. First one. 
Please try to remember that what they believe, as well as what they do, and cause you to endure, does not testify to your inferiority, but to their inhumanity. From my point of view, no label, no slogan, no party, no skin colour, and indeed no religion, is more important than the human being. The next theme is mental health. And the podcast that covered this topic? Let go of toxic people in your life. Stages of leaving an abusive relationship. The psychology of resentment. The lost souls of Windsor. Slow dancing in a burning room. The psychology of jealousy and hate. The psychology of family and groups. In all of these areas, the British Royal Family and the UK media, the general response, usually in articles or TV and programmes, is as follows. Never admit that anyone within the British Royal Family has any mental health issues. Royal HR openly admitted that it would look bad on the British Royal Family if it was known that Princess Meghan was seeking help. Help the British Royal Family refused to give. Ignored the information about suicidal ideation, but seemed more than comfortable to have discussions with royal reporters to discuss the state of health. And UK media increased their onslaught onto Meghan rather than stop or at least reduce their cruel reports and activities. Seemingly, a death by suicide in the royal family was an acceptable risk, not least because the British royal family and royal reporters work hand in glove, and we can all imagine the reporting content which would leave both the British royal family and the UK media in the clear. Now that all the information is now in the global public domain, the hunter has had to change their approach to how they now wound rather than terminate their prey. Activity has shifted to trying to defame, and just in case that does not work, as it hasn't so far, then the idea is to target businesses who have, or who are, or who are likely to want to work with the Archwell Foundation. The ultimate goal is to remove the Sussexes from people's consciousness. Their mistake is to think that this could happen and that somehow the whole global audience would turn all their attention to the British royal family to the same degree. Do they think that all the good, impactful deeds in such a short period would be erased from the global audience's mind? Do you not think that the British royal family and UK media would be mortally harmed reputational-wise and any thought that they could ride the wave of suspicions about the huge part that the British royal family and UK media had to play in the activities of the Sussexes since 2016 is naive and arrogant. The eyes of the world is watching now and any activity done with the intent to cause harm to life or business won't fly this time, no matter the content of any fairy tales in UK media. And just as a closing note on this theme, a quote from Prince Harry that I think is very applicable to remind people is this. Mental illness is nothing to shame or hide. It affects all of us. A quote from James Baldwin on this topic. I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their stubbornly views on hate is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. Another quote, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, 
But then you read, It was books that taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all of the people who were alive or who had ever been alive. The next theme, value for money, and the podcast that covered this area. A nation which creates the news, as opposed to reporting on the news, has a failing economy. The business of royal propaganda. Which members of the royal family are publicly funded? When the service model becomes obsolete. Being a royal and being philanthropic. Welcome to the Windsor Twilight Zone. Your workforce plan is all wrong. Private and royal patronages. I have never seen a report or article that has ever indicated that the British royal family or its media actually care or feel the need to provide value for money. It is the inherent belief that the monarchy is adored, no matter what. Like I've said, all of you need to agree on the direction of travel to royal life, not just the journey to deliver the Queen's speech. The impression that I personally get about the way Prince Harry is treated is anger, but mainly jealousy, because dressing like him and trying to do the same things and appear in the same spaces in the future will not work. You are not him, and your wife is not Meghan. I think you will know who I'm referring to in this short paragraph. All of you, find your own identity and work to improve it by actions. The multitude of saviours who are identified from month to month in UK royalty Feels like you think you are all Marvel characters. None of the saviours have even looked or sounded convincing about presenting themselves correctly to the public, let alone saving the monarchy. Start to be realistic in your ambitions and activities and build slowly. Otherwise, there will be more lost Commonwealth countries and unfavourable trade deals placed in front of the UK, because the nations trading know that the options have drastically reduced since the UK decided to plough its own furrow. Britain is no longer great, but there is a slight chance it could move in that direction again, but it requires a sense of realism, not bluster. Next theme, legal. And the podcasts, reporting on the Sussexes in the UK, misinformation and disinformation. It's a royal knockout. International Bill of Rights. Meghan, working royal or slave. Human rights protection under the law. International call to action. Human rights breaches in plain sight. I have a dream. Who do narcissistic men target? Psychology of family and groups. Coercive control across borders. UK media obsession. Stalking and harassment. Blurred lines between monarchy and government. A quote from James Baldwin. Ask any Mexican, any Puerto Rican, any black man, any poor person. Ask the wretched how they fare in the halls of justice, and then you will know. Not whether or not the country is just, but whether or not it has any love for justice or any concept of it. It is certain in any case that ignorance, allied with power, is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. Another quote. 
If one really wishes to know how justice is administered in a country, one does not question the policemen, the lawyers, the judges, or the protected members of the middle class. One goes to the unprotected, those precisely who need the law's protection most, and listen to their testimony. Next theme, history. The Dukes of Sussex, one of the podcasts that dealt with this. Queen Charlotte, Princess Diana, Doria Ragland. Family lines impacted British royal family through the ages. Remembering veterans. Exploring the existence of Black Tudors. And we did another episode on Black Tudors for USA Black History Month. Let's talk about reparations. That was a three-part series. 100, excuse me, 1,000 plus years of UK monarchy. Response from a freed slave to a former master's letter and the modern equivalent of the same situation. California princess to UK Cinderella, to global princess. British royal family and UK media general response. The firm and associates underestimated both Meghan and Harry big time and still convinced themselves that the middle section of the title of this podcast, the, the last one I've just referred to, where I said UK Cinderella, is the be-all and end-all of everyone's aspirations. This is referring to a section of that podcast where I stated that in the title, California Princess, UK Cinderella, Global Princess, that the UK has this notion that only the UK element is important and that everyone aspires to be a princess in the UK. We will see. And generally, it appears that the British royal family and its media are still mortally wounded by the fact that the Sussexes walked away from this dysfunctional, failing institution and are thriving outside of the toxic environment that UK media would have you believe is the pinnacle of life's journey. When in reality, with each passing day, it is clear that it is the weakest link in the three categories and contains people who are inherently poorly educated, no meaningful accomplishments, and go through life with a sense of entitlement to their every wish and whim. Every act of cruelty and the fake critique of every action of the suffixes, Meghan in particular, is eroding what little time the firm has left. A quote from James Baldwin. White people were, and are, astounded by the Holocaust in Germany. They did not know that they could act that way, but I very much doubt whether black people were astounded. That was James Baldwin in 1962. Another famous quote. The victim who is able to articulate the situation of the victim has ceased to be a victim. He has become a threat. There was a news item one morning, uh, some months ago, where the newscaster posed a question and gave two examples which illustrated his point. The newscaster presenter posed a question which was, why are this lot trying to make enemies of our neighbours? It was a news item about Brexit and the handling of white refugees and black refugees. The white ones being housed in the UK and the government giving people who have offered up rooms for them a monthly payment. The white ones have an online visa application process. The black nations have not been offered this facility. 
hence the desperation to escape from war zones and arrive in all manner of small boats to the UK shoreline. And the answer is to fly them to Rwanda to be processed. At the time, and it still does, the question resonated with me because one could ask the same question about the industry of hate contrived to home in on an individual with zero concerns for risk to health and well-being or even loss of life. It would not be the first person to lose their life after entanglement with certain UK professions. In this analogy, I am referring to UK media, which illustrates hunting their prey is the money-making activity, and if the prey dies, they simply find another target. The last royal prey was Princess Diana. So, in the conclusion of this podcast, remembering that I said there are there is much, much more in the article in, against each of the themes, against each of the uh, responses, um, as well as, I said, a myriad of quotes from James Baldwin. So, conclusions. One final point on this is that no matter what the Sussexes do or not do, the transfer of their success and popularity will never move to the British royal family. You have the base that you were confident would always be there and support you no matter what. So go and do the things that benefit the UK as a starting point. Right now, since Sussexes have moved to another continent, public funds are being used to hunt and destroy the Sussexes via vanity projects. It just seems like those in line for the throne are just sitting around plotting against each other, giving away each other's secrets in a drip-drip approach and cannot wait to sit on the throne and be adored by a few people on an island that most people outside of it care even less about now than they did before because of the very actions and practices used against the Sussexes. You will reap what you sow. Take note of the key themes that have emerged from the first year of SGUK podcasts and feedback from the many countries who interact with the channel have provided strong evidence. SGUK has never been and will not be distracted by the daily fluff pieces aimed at getting a reaction. Apart from the obvious desperation that is on display by UK media, the SGUK community is well versed on propaganda techniques and the historical data and research papers are there for all to see. We are not swayed by the Jack and Nori titles and as one of the Raw Reporter crew quite happily publicly posted, a response to a well-known QC expressing concern about the racist tones of UK media reporting when it comes to the Sussexes. The response admitted that, the response by the Royal Reporter here, yes, there were indeed racist tones in the articles, but that racist tones are not against the law, end of quote. That post speaks volumes and is a useful receipt to have, and is of interest to many as it shows the approach used when dealing with the Sussexes, which the Global Support Network have known since 2016. And in the lead up to the wedding that you all did not want to see take place, and then all minds were lost on the 8th of January 2020, when your chew toys decided not to be part of that game anymore. As a UK taxpayer, I do not consider the British royal family to give value for money. I am not a supporter of a monarchy structure anyway, but there are some out there at least trying to improve. The British royal family only seem concerned now that the spotlight that they craved is on them and that they have lost their favourite prince, who, despite all the hurdles placed in their way, by the British royal family, are very successful 
and moving on to additional areas of activity. The royal family have been found wanting and exposed and now look like headless chickens caught in the headlights. The royal reporters spend most of their time researching, spying, being involved or trying to be involved in Sussex business, which is a huge statement to the world that the family who they are employed to support and to push forward as the best thing for the UK does not hold their interest and does not earn them even a small percentage of what they earn from Sussex, fourth hand, fifth hand, sixth hand and probably even more crumbs. When it comes to value for money, I would say that both the British Royal Family and the UK media royal reporters are not necessary and certainly not in the numbers employed now. If the monarchy you are meant to write about does not garner enough interest to keep you all occupied each day, that is not a positive image or message to put out there. This podcast channel is looking forward to what our second year brings. It would be a positive outlook if all groups just stayed in their lane and ceased to interfere in matters of no importance to anyone in the UK. Focus on the dire circumstances of people in the UK in the coming months and focus on what value your monarchy and its press and the others in the societal groups mentioned at the beginning can do for the UK. It is clear that there is one rule for those held in favour in UK royal circles and a different one applied to the Sussexes. That approach will ensure that the UK continues to sink further into the toxic waste it has created. It is also not a good idea to continue to abuse a USA USA family simply for existing. A family you wanted to leave and they have done so. I know you did not expect Prince Harry to go too, but he is not like most of the royal men in the UK. He loves his wife and children, and the constant danger the UK puts them in daily is mind-blowing. But as a non-legal person, I cannot see the situation being allowed to run freely for years to come. James Baldwin was one of America's greatest thinkers and writers on the subject of race. What would he have thought about present-day protests against police brutality and for racial equity. We can glean much about his thoughts from his rich legacy of writing and recorded interviews. Here are a few quotes from James Baldwin, most from over half a century ago, that are particularly resonant today. From his book The Fire Next Time from 1963. You were born where you were born and face the future that you faced because you were black and for no other reason. The limits of your ambition were thus expected to be set forever. You were born into a society which spelled out brutal clarity, and in as many ways as possible that you were a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity exactly what the British royal family wanted from Princess Meghan. Chair of Princeton's Department of African American Studies and an author of Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lesson for Our Own. And this is a quote from Eddie Glaude quoting Baldwin in 1980. What we are dealing with, really, is that for black people in this country, there is no legal code at all. We are still governed, if that is the word I want, by the slave code. Another quote. We know that a man is not a thing and is not to be placed at the mercy of things. We know that air and water belong to all mankind and not merely to industrialists. 
We know that a baby does not come into the world merely to be an instrument of someone else's profit. We know that democracy does not mean the coercion of all into a deadly and finally wicked mediocrity, but the liberty for all to aspire to the best that is in him or that has ever been. This is from an open letter to my sister, Miss Angela Davis, published in November 19, on the 19th in 1970, in the New York Times Review of Books. Think of raw reporters and at least one member of the royal family in particular, our much-loved Princess Diana, in this next quote. People don't have any mercy. They tear you limb from limb in the name of love. Then, when you're dead, when they've killed you by what they made you go through, they say you didn't have any character. They weep big, bitter tears, not for you, for themselves, because they've lost their toy. From a Dick Cavett interview in 1969. If any white man in the world says, give me liberty or give me death, the entire white world applauds. When a black man says exactly the same thing, word for word, he is judged a criminal and treated like one. And everything possible is done to make an example of this bad and the N-word, so there won't be any more like him. End of quote. Another quote from the same interview with James Baldwin. The police are a very real menace to every black cat alive in this country. And no matter how many people say you're being paranoid when you talk about police brutality, I know what I'm talking about. I survived those streets and those precinct basements, and I know. And I'll tell you this, I know what it was like when I was really helpless, how many beatings I got. And I know what happens now because I'm not really helpless. But I know too that if he, police, don't know that this is Jimmy Baldwin and not just some other, and the N-word again, he's going to blow my head off, just like he blows off everybody else's head. It could happen to my mother in the morning, to my sister, to my brother. For me, this has always been a violent country. It has never been a democracy. End of quote. And the final quote in this podcast, but one of many that are in the article, together with a multitude of beautiful, evocative images of James Baldwin and various quotes, some of them on the images and some of them that I've listed underneath. So this final quote. Nearing the end of his life in the mid-1980s, Baldwin's patience had run out. The angle he had channeled into his writing could no longer be quelled. He expressed his outrage and frustration in these words from an interview in the documentary film James Baldwin, The Price of the Ticket. What is it you want me to reconcile myself to? You always told me it takes time. It has taken my father's time, my mother's time, my uncle's time, my brother's and my sister's time, my niece's and my nephew's time. How much time do you want for your progress? That's the end of this week's podcast. As I said, I have made it much shorter um, based on that feedback that I received. And I do welcome feedback over the next three to four weeks of your views on that. My thoughts are that I would like to have podcasts that run, I would say, between 30 minutes to an hour. There will be odd occasions because of the subject matter that it will go over, but generally I think 30, 30 45 minutes 
seems to be the um, the average of the ones I've done so far, and a few have gone over the hour. This particular topic is one that probably could have been done in two podcasts because of the wealth of information that could have been included as part of the um, audio. And certainly you will see all the information that I pulled together over the weeks in the article. So once again, the article is quite long, but no one is asking you to read that in one go if you don't wish to. Um, But the article is long because it contains things that I haven't mentioned here. I've just tried to give an outline of the structure of the podcast and the article in terms of the themes, the podcasts that um, come under each of those themes, the responses or um, anything that's been published by raw reporters or raw family um, opinions on things, and then um, the quotes from so many uh, that James Baldwin has provided um, over his lifetime, and I have included them. I looked at them as many as possible, literally over hundreds, and divided them or picked out the ones that suited the themes of the podcast that we've done over the last 12 months. And I have listed many of them in the article and I have provided links for you to go and look at more because there are many, many um, websites out there with these wonderful quotes from this wonderful man. Um, Lots of, I said, evocative imagery. I've tried to give a flavour of that in this lengthy article, but ultimately, if you are that interested, you will see there are several links for you to click on and uh, explore further. And as I said, there are a number of video links. I usually do one um, in an article, but because I've not spoken about those things in detail, that are covered in those video clips. And also, I think each of the video clips merit um, viewing. So there are a number of them that the the links are live, so they will appear in the article. And there are about a similar number of sort of six, six or eight um, videos that I haven't made the links live because they would have popped up on the screen as a video window. And I think there are quite a few there already. So that would have been an extremely long article. But I have put the links. You just need to copy and paste and put those uh, into the web and you will see further videos of James being interviewed and giving his views on a wide a range of things. Albeit he's speaking about the USA earlier on um, in his writing, but I included his quotes because I feel that they go beyond the USA and it's about oppression And in this case, we looked at race, mental health and so on. So those topics are across the board. And I wanted to use powerful um, quotes from a respected person to highlight the themes that we came through almost by accident on SG. Because I was pursuing, as you know, topics that are uh, linked with Archwell Foundation and its priorities And then from that, extrapolate out information from rural activity towards the Sussexes and relate it to, as you will know, academic themes and academic models and just general day to day life to make it real and up to date. So whatever you're reading, you can apply in your sort of day to day life, workplace or otherwise. So that's the reason for the shortened podcast, although I've probably spent another 10 minutes telling you that. Um, But I, I really want to know. Um, what you all generally feel about the length of podcasts because if you want them shorter and whatever that the universal the average comes out at that's what I will do and if it means that I go into two or three podcasts on the same topic that's what I'll do um, I have podcasts as you can appreciate notes and research already done from over um, the last few weeks So they will run. Some of them are split. If you're looking at thinking of some of them, they are going to be long. Um, The two weeks that I'm away next month, 
I will probably pick one subject and split that anyway. So that those two will be short for certain because I can do that easily. Um, but just general feedback on that so that I know how to approach and how to structure podcast for the next 12 months. So speak to you in the comments as normal and I will speak to you all again in next week's podcast on Sunday. Bye for now. Bye.